So I'd like to talk about a basic circuit and actually look at both its noise performance and a sort of small signal performance. And so I'm going to look at, in this case, a source follower. And again, I'm going to assume that sigma is equal to zero because in this case we know that there's really not going to be any significant gain here. And if I look at VREF, um, that's going to set a basically a bias current. So this entire transistor is heavily just acting like a bias, bias current. And so it doesn't even really show up in the normal small signal model behavior. But M1 would actually have sort of gate and source dependence, and you'd see both the, you'd see both the gate and the source dependence in the system. But to deal with the noise, you have two additional sources, one from M1 and one from M2, of a noise source of I1 and one from I2, that are both going to be based on what the bias current is. Ah, right, there's a bias current, a reference current, that comes out of that structure. Very good. So if you looked at that in terms of some reference current, there's a number of things you could imagine. Well, first, if you want to just look at this without the noise, because this is typically what we do, you'd look at the analysis with the behavior in terms of signals without the noise, and then you look at the analysis with the, of just the noise and the signals off. Again, it's a linear system. I get superposition. Yay! And that actually is what helps me kind of think through the analysis of these elements. Now, if this turns out to be large enough that I don't have a small signal analysis, that's a different question. Almost always you think of this in small signal. Um, you can actually take noise and amplify it up to a large value, and it's actually kind of a neat idea because people ask, can I make a noise generator in analog? And the answer is, yes, you can. Um, and it's really not that hard to do. You just have to kind of do uh, work on some details of it, and it's actually a very effective piece of computation. So effective a piece of computation that the very first thing that anyone has actually demonstrated of a quantum computing experimentally was a noise generator. And say, look, I built a more efficient noise generator than I would have done digitally. Analogs have been done yeah, decades beforehand, but that's fine. It all works very well. So if I look at the element without noise, I'm going to just get a gain of kappa plus a 1 over tau s where that tau is going to be C over GS, or if I'm thinking about it, it's going to be CUT over IREF, because I would never just leave it here, right, unless I'm kind of doing intermediate stuff. So then when I look at the noise sources, I realize I've got two of them, which means that they're both, you know, again, remember the fundamental equation for noise is 2QI delta F in saturation, and they're both in saturation, so we're good here. But I got two of them, and I got to add their noise variance. I don't get to subtract them. I don't, not here. There are some cases where you can look at this carefully, but that is not the case. And technically what you do is you look at for one noise source and analyze it, and then you do the second noise source and analyze it through superposition. And then by superposition, you add up their noise variance. Well, if they're identical in the same place, you can just kind of combine them in this way. And then, but it's at square root two. And so what that means is, if I look at the output, it's basically going to be that reference current over GS, because there won't be any input. GS effect looks like a resistance, so it looks like a current source into the resistance. No problem there. And then I can do a little bit of math, and I go, oh, look, this is 4 Q UT squared delta F over, I, over IRA. By the way, the thing with the source follower is it's kind of like one of the most fundamental circuits, because you have this sort of sort of basic UT dependent, basically sort of source dependence on this. Um, if you're curious about some of these expressions, you also see some almost identical discussions in some other areas. Uh, there are BJTs, you'll get this, and other certain sort of idealized cases in um, other circuits, you'll see the same question. So here's an interesting thing, right? So I get this sort of core element of voltage over per root hertz in the passband. And this is sort of the flat part where there's no dynamics going on, right? So notice there's a 1 plus tau s, but just kind of looking at the 1 part, not the tau s part. And this is very useful. What's interesting is to kind of look at what this number would be for a source follower. And the reason it's relevant to have a sense of the numbers here is that for other circuits, they basically scale this number. And so you might as well, once you know these numbers, they're just scaled values, and it gives you a really rough feel for this. So if you're looking at this from one peak and one up, to one microamp, you can definitely see how this changes, but notice that the noise variance squared varies with the current, so inversely. So more current 
means lower noise, but it's the square root factor. So it's not like a huge, fast-moving thing. So it's something very important to be, pay attention to. So once you've solved this, what you realize is I can now ask questions of what is my total noise? Okay. And that's actually asking what is the integral over the entire set of frequencies. Well, if I take this core structure here and basically look at this delta f as effectively df, and I remember to have the 1 plus tau term in there, now the, the tau s, the s I'm not going to do it in it's omega, but we're integrating over frequency, so I want to be able to look over these terms properly. Um, now I look at what I'm getting here, and by the way, there's ones here and a one here. Uh, I just realized it's a small typo. Also, you'll see that down in the comments. And what you end up getting for that integral is it's then 1 over 4 tau. Great. And you think, well, that really simplifies all of this huge integral. We come straight. It actually means the 4 the fours go out of the way. The 1 over tau gives you something that's an I, gives you a I ref over ut. So those go out of the way. When I'm done solving this, that noise value squared is q u t over c. Now remember that u t is k t over q. So you'll see this often talk about as k t over c noise. First thing to understand, it's not a secondary noise source. It is a result of solving this. Okay, and you could, you basically will get, you know, and you can think about q u t over c is like usually an easier way for me to calculate it personally. And it's useful to kind of see what those numbers look like as a function of capacitance. This is the total noise over the entire bandwidth. And notice it's independent on the current. Because if you think about it, if I have a higher current, I get a higher bandwidth, but I get more noise. So that's kind of how that works out in terms of understanding what KT over C noise does. Classical way also to derive KT over C noise is a resistor and a capacitor. And you get the exact same behavior because, because a resistor you can do it at zero bias, it means you've got two, two currents actually subtracting each other, which that means you actually have two noise sources that have to add. Right? This is actually comes from Raul Sharpeskar's sort of perspective on this and a really foundational work on this. And so you get exactly the same derivation. And so what happens is you see this formulation show up again and again and again almost everywhere.